The Joys of Owning Your Own Cash-Based Medical Practice with Dr. Emily Porter on this episode of Bootstrap MD. Hey guys, Dr. Mike Wiming. I hope you are doing well. Uh, this is a recording that I did with Dr. Emily Porter. You may have seen her video recently. It's been seen by over millions on protecting yourself against COVID-19. And she also owns her own uh, cash-based medical spa called Wrinkle Free MD in Austin, Texas. And I got to have an the privilege of having an interview with her about why she opened her own practice, uh, the effects of being an emergency room physician and then running a practice on the side, and how that all works for her and why it is a decision that she's never regretted. So sit back and enjoy this episode with Dr. Emily Porter. Hey guys, this is Dr. Mike Wu Ming. Welcome to another episode of Bootstrap MD. We've got a great treat on the call. I've been following this woman for months, not in a stalker weirdo way, but just seeing what she's been doing and just seeing doing some amazing things. Uh, she's Dr. Emily Porter. She's the Austin Love Doctor. She's a board certified emergency room doctor with 10 years of experience uh, working in emergency rooms. And then she started her own aesthetics practice in the area of Austin, Texas, Leander, Texas, to be specific. And uh, she has been one of those people who's been out there doing it. She's all about um, helping other doctors and learning from them. I've been seeing her on some of the calls that, that we're at. Uh, we're both involved in, um, in a type of a practice that involves PRP and using it for things like the O shot and P shot. And she's been just tremendous in helping other doctors. And I wanted her to get on the call because it's all about letting you guys know who is out there actually making a difference and being a role model for other physicians who want to start their own practice. So without further ado, Dr. Emily Porter. Emily, so glad to have you on the call today. Thanks for having me. I'm so honored. I, I love this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a talker, so ask away. Yes, yes. I've learned that very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got some really good information and a lot of good information for our listeners to share. So I, I gave you a little bit, a brief kind of bio out there for, for the folks just to get an idea. But tell me your story. Uh, you know, well, how did the ER doctor become the Austin love doctor? Yeah, so I won't get into how I became an ER doctor, but um, let's just say that I became very unhappy in the emergency room, which I never thought would happen. Um, everyone knows the, the story of the circumstances of corporate mergers and patient satisfaction over things that you have no control and opioid epidemic and things. Um, and uh, I also became a mother around the same time, but that really doesn't have anything to do with that. I was an ER doctor for three more years after that, um, but I did have four children in four years, so wow. I decided, let me see, when I, had, was, when I was pregnant with my fourth child, and my oldest was three, so I had four babies in four years and two months, and I went, I just was like, I got, I got Botox for the first time. What actually happened is I had gone on a medical mission to Guatemala and mm -hmm. I felt like I looked older than all the women that were there <laughs> because <laughs> it was a bunch of plastic surgeons and their wives, right? And, and the nurses, and they were all getting Botox. And I was like, well, I should get a little Botox. So I got yeah. a little Botox. And then three months later, I got a little more Botox. Um, and I thought, this is dumb. Why am I paying somebody else to do this, right? It can't be rocket science if this person's doing this. So let me go take a course. So I took a course and I came back. My mother was an entrepreneur um, and she actually went with me to the course. It was like a weekend you know, course and she was my model. And I came back on the plane and I said, I'm gonna open a med spa. Like pregnant, <laughs> four months, four months pregnant with my fourth baby. Um, working, you know, a couple different ER jobs uh, and as a 1099 contractor for very little pay, I found out I was paying my plumber more per hour than I was making. Um, <laughs> Austin is a very high demand city. It makes all the lists of all the, you know, cool places to live. And so your salary goes down and down and down the more desirable location you live. Um, and I've been here, I've been here for like seven years at the time. And so I, my, my mom sitting next to me, who is, I love my mom, but she's a tough critic. She goes, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I thought, if I got the blessing of mom, <laughs> I didn't get a loan from the bank of mom. <laughs> that was a whole other story. But I thought, okay, this might not be so crazy. And literally from May 
until September with no training, no business, nothing. I just threw it all together um, and opened the end of like, I think my first patient was September 30th when I had a four week old baby at home mm. and the other three. Wow. So just decided I needed a change and um, I wanted to do something where I had more control over the experience that my patients were having. I wanted to, I, I'm, I just wanted to have, have joy in medicine again. And I think going to Guatemala, I mean, I cried when I was down there. Those people were so happy to just have people take care of them. And I felt like I was a doctor again. And I felt like I was, I mean, I, Altruistic, yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I didn't go there to feel good about myself, right? I went there to help other people. But I had been just so bitter and I, was, I felt like I was sinking into burnout and the whole moral abuse. And I thought I got to do something else. Um, and I'd always kind of been a little bit interested in aesthetics and I had melanoma like 19 years ago. And so, mm. but again, I, I'd never gotten more than a facial. So I didn't know anything about it and just thought, well, let me see if I can do this and started researching and just kind of threw everything into it. Learned a lot along the way, made a lot of mistakes for sure. So how was the first couple of years? Now, just to get an idea, were you still working your ER shifts? Were you cutting back? Yeah. So I had the luxury of the main ER gigs I was working were at freestanding ERs mm -hmm. and they didn't pay great, but they also, you know, you had some hours that you might not have any patients. So uh, and what I did was I, I worked, you know, I had one job where I worked six 24 hour shifts a month. And then I had another ER freestanding ER where I did like a bunch of 12s, make another six 12s a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took advantage of the downtime. You know, if I got up at two o'clock in the morning with a patient and they were there for a couple hours and I was just waiting on labs, I would watch a webinar on something. I, I found, I would read something about a business plan. Um, I would go, I had a sight on laser. I would go watch some educational video. Uh, so I still very much worked, you know, a full-time, a full-time ER job and then half time at another ER job. And then I would, you know, I'd work a 24 hour shift, come home, sleep for two hours and then go see patients um, in the med spa. But I would, you know, usually be able to sleep at night a little bit, but I just found all my free time that I was out of the house um, and I had, again, I had the luxury of having a husband who had an income, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't cut back at all. I actually worked more. And the loan that I got when I did my build out, I started in a one room, you know, 10 by 12 hair salon rental, booth rental with one bed and I hired an esthetician to answer the cell phone um, and do a few things. She could do treatments in Texas. Um, if I had seen the patient, diagnosed the condition, prescribed the treatment, and given her the settings, she could administer like a photo facial. Um, I did not allow her to do more than that. You know, she did like microneedling and photo facials, but she didn't do fillers or Botox or anything that I wasn't comfortable with. So she basically could do that on the days that I was in the ER. And then on, on the days that I had off, I would go in there by appointment only and take care of my hormone patient, do my late, do, you know, Botox and fillers. And just, I started building my brand and building my clientele because I was an ER doctor. I didn't, it's not like I was a gynecologist. I could just put a sign up that said now offering hormones, or I was an internist that could put a sign up that said, you know, we now do Botox. I had to build it from nothing. Um, and I guaranteed my loan when I moved about mm, nine months later, we moved into, or seven months later, we moved into a 2000 square foot space. Um, my loan was actually not an SBA, Small Business Administration loan. It was actually through a private bank, Frost Bank. Mm -hmm. And it was a conventional loan that we actually just secured against our income. It was a better rate. There was less paperwork. But I made Frost Bank a promise that I would continue to work in the ER until I could float my business. And that if at any time I got behind, I had the availability, I could go to remote Texas and make three times as much and go do a weekend somewhere. I never had to do that, thankfully. And then I gradually just started cutting back my shifts um, to where a, about a year ago, uh, so about three and a half years into it, uh, about, no, about, sorry, about two, a little over two years into it, um, not quite two years in the full space, I quit the ER completely because it mm -hmm. got to the point to where working those 24-hour shifts, I, I think I did like a Sunday night, I would do a 24-hour shift because my med spa was closed on Monday. Um, I opened Tuesday through Saturday. It got to where working in the ER was 
actually taking away from my non-patient care time to be able to do things like have this podcast and, and develop my business and grow my business and travel to lectures and things. So I was able to start paying myself and cut back my ER job. So, uh, and just so I understand, how long have you had your, your practice now? How long has it been? Yeah. So my first patient was like September 30th of 2016. So about a uh, little under four years, three, under- three, three and a half years. Wow. The that's, dot almost. That's great. And you're able to leave after two years. And from mm-hmm. what I understand, you just said you were at 1099. So it was easy for you to, to uh, just discontinue the shift or did you? Yeah, have I other- just, you know, I just, I, I, I was 1099. I had one job The the full-time job, I just left completely. Again, they got bought by some company. They started yeah. asking me to do some unethical shady crap about billing and, and overbilling. And, and they're actually out of business now. Um, and so I, I just started, um, cutting back, I quit that job. And then I just started cutting back a little bit. And then finally, um, I just told them, I, told, I left on very good terms. I left the door wide open. I'm still board certified. I'm still credentialed at the place I was. I just said, and the other, you know, he gets it. He, it was a locally owned business, Austin emergency room or Austin emergency center. And, um, I'm friends with the owner, you know, as a business person and he understands he's like, I own a business too. You got to do what's right for you. So I just said, I, I don't have enough availability right now. And I just started cutting back. Um, and he, they said, well, if you ever want more shifts or you want to pick anything up, just let us know. So there's a lot of doctors who are interested in aesthetics. They may take a weekend course. Uh, they may decide to do it on their own. But let's be honest, a lot of them fail to do it or don't proceed. Where do you think you succeeded while others didn't? I had a couple things. One is I realized that you can't learn this stuff in a weekend. If you want to be a bad injector, you go to a weekend course. If you want to be good at this, you have to really, really invest a lot of time. And, you know, I, I, you got to put the work in. I think a lot of people fail because they think, especially with aesthetics or even just entrepreneurship in general, they think it's mailbox money, that it's get, get rich quick money. And it's the opposite. I, I mean, I worked a hundred hours for two years. I worked more than I worked in residency. I slept five hours a night. Uh, every minute I had, I was doing something. I spent a couple hundred thousand dollars over the first two years uh, training, going to workshops, any opportunity that I had, I would go learn something. Um, and I, I had a laser early on, which I think helped me. It was definitely, there was a, now there was a bigger payment, but I learned very quickly about cost of goods and overhead and what things really you're able to make money on and, and what pays your rent. And so I had a Cyton laser, which I don't get paid by Cyton um, yet. Although, you know, I might become a luminary for them. I, they're a great company, but they're in Silicon Valley and they're still a family owned company. And they specifically were very supportive. They have this um, thing called the, what do they call it? The business, It's like a business success builder. And basically when you purchase a laser platform with them, which it's, I liked it because it was one that you could build upon instead of having to have this machine that does this and this machine that does this, it was like this one thing and you can just add, you know, hand pieces to it. And it still only takes up one amount of space in your room. They gave me a lot of training with that. They sent Mm -hmm. me to a consultant in Kansas city who was brilliant, who, who is not a physician and he's a, just a, brilliant salesman. He was a laser salesman and businessman. And he said, this is what I did. And I also, I reached out to an ER doctor friend who owns a place in Olympia, Washington. And she kind of told me she bought a laser early that, or she didn't, that was a mistake that she made. She wished she'd bought a laser sooner. She opened into one room hair salon. I just kind of picked her brain. And then I think I just listened to the people that were doing it and were Mm -hmm. doing it well. Um, the biggest mistake I made early on, a couple of them, was one, I worried about my competition too much. I mm. spent too much time obsessing about, oh my God, oh my God, there's another place opening and they're charging less and, and blah, 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 blah. And I wasted energy and time that I could have been bettering myself worrying about them. The other thing is I didn't get books truly set up correctly from the get-go. I didn't have a bookkeeper. I didn't have a CPA that was local to help me figure out cash flow statements and really get QuickBooks set up. And so even three and a half years later, we're still digging ourselves out of a kind of a bit of a bookkeeping mess, um, just having to kind of make everything 
look right um, because they have to, the books have to carry over year to year. So um, my taxes are paid and all that, but we, we need to have a better management of inventory. We had a lot of spoilage, for example, like we overordered. I let the reps talk me into spend this much money and your cost of this will only be this. And, oh, that sounds like a great deal. I'm a sucker for it at, at the grocery store, buy this, get this free. And I ended up not, I overbought and I wasn't able to use like, for example, things with expiration um, fillers and, and it, it expired and they wouldn't replace them. So I overbought because I listened to the reps. Um, big mistake. It's still cheaper to have pay a little bit more per thing and have your profit be a little bit less than it ha is to have thousands and tens of thousands of dollars go to waste, which happened. Yes. So yeah, a couple, couple of points there that, that you, you illuminated. One was you had, you followed people who already were successful. You followed with the salesman and you had people in place and you didn't listen to what your competitors are saying. And it also seemed that your pricing is you didn't, you know, a lot of, a lot of problems where I see docs is they start to panic and then they just want to be Walmart. They want to be the low cost leader and you know, what's the lowest price that we can get. And it sounds like you kind of stuck to your guns there. I did. I did. When we moved, I had my price. And we, we do a big annual event and that's my big sale. Um, we do a little special here and there, but I did when we moved into the new place, which was end of May, I mm -hmm. had maybe 200, 300 name, you know, clients on an, on an email list. So I had some business coming in. I had a little bit of walk in traffic, but all of a sudden I went from having me and one esthetician at $18 an hour laser tech to having, I had to have a front desk now because I had a, mm -hmm. I had a desk. <laughs> I had to have, you know, somebody to answer the phone and my esthetician. And I went to having, you know, cool sculpting. I bought cool sculpting. So I had a tech for that. And I ended up really staff heavy. And it, in the summer is the worst time for aesthetics because people go on vacations. We tell sure. people you can't do laser treatments if you're going to be out in the sun. And so I did panic a little bit um, when we first moved and I did group on for Botox. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did it for about a week and decided it was the worst thing ever. I got in a big fight with them. They, they didn't want to let me cancel it. I, I sold maybe like 40 in a week. And half the people were people that were already my clients who were just looking for a deal. Right. And I think we were selling, we think we took our, our Botox from $10 a unit. It's now 12, by the way. I think we took it from 10 to eight. And then Groupon takes half. Right. And, you know, you pay more than if you really do the math, you pay more than eight per unit. If you include sure. overhead and loss yeah, in the yeah. syringes and having to retreat people who don't get results. Um, that's the other thing. I always guaranteed my work. I mm -hmm. always said, if, if you're not happy, I'll make it right. Um, and that was some really good advice that I got, uh, especially in the last like year and a half when I met Dr. Runnels is he said, you can't ethically charge somebody cash for something and then keep their money if they're not happy. And, um, and I, people know that cause they're taking much less of a risk. If, if you're going to go buy a watch at Walmart and it breaks and Walmart can take back a $20 watch, then you need to be able to have somebody spend $600 on Botox and have them love what you do. And I learned how to get rid of the people that didn't appreciate and value me. And I've had to do that a few times. And that was a really, really hard lesson. You keep people, that just they're they're bad they're trouble and you keep them too long and you start oh what can I do to make it right and you're you're constantly catering to them and you're realizing like they don't trust you and right. they do this everywhere you start following a couple people and they go up and they write negative reviews all over town and they and I did that once I didn't I didn't cut her off when I finally did cut her off she wrote a horrible review so it's like yeah. that's one person. Yeah, and that's something that I've taken to is, is you know, 95% of your clientele will love you. It's always that 5%. And if those 5% get to be a drain, you need to be able to say, hey, you know what? It's just, we're not a good fit and let them go and say bye-bye. And it's always going to be that, you know, no matter what you do. Yeah, the one I, did, one I did was about a year ago, the last one I did. And I, it was so liberating when I did it. I just, I, I won't get into the circumstances, but she didn't trust me. She didn't, she didn't, she wasn't happy. She didn't trust me. And I felt that. And again, in my gut, the first thing I said was, oh, let me 
just give you this for free. Let me do this for you for free to keep you. And I, I just said, I took one for the team and I said, I am so sorry that I let you down. I'm, I'm, I feel so bad that you had to drive, you know, 30 minutes to get here two times and I'm so sorry. And let me go ahead and just refund your money. Um, and, and, and take care of it. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. And the implication was don't come back. And when I do a refund for somebody, I make them sign a, a disclosure. So I yeah. had her sign something that said it's, it's nothing le like scholarly. I mean it, but it basically says this date, I got this procedure. I was refunded this amount. And by accepting this refund, I agree that I won't disparage Dr. Porter, my staff, either verbally or, you know, on social media or in reviews or whatever. And, and they sign it. And again, I don't know if it'll hold up in court, but I think it scares people enough to realize like, okay, I'm just going to walk away. Yeah. Yeah. We have something very, very similar. And so far it's, it's worked, you know, yeah, uh, we rarely do that, but when it does, they tend to be the same people who do it again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, and then they're like, Oh, well, well, no, I want you to come back. <laughs> Yeah, and the punishment is that they if you refund them as they lose you. They have yeah. to go find somebody else. Right, right, right. So hopefully they'll they'll find happiness somewhere else. So, right. so your different procedures that you started when you said you started up with laser, you did some aesthetics, I guess at the yeah. Beginning. I mostly so the first thing I did was I learned the PRP. Yeah, uh, because I thought that was that was really new and trending, and I thought it was really cool stuff. And I was comfortable doing pelvic exams for O shots. I was comfortable doing, you know, examining men. Uh, I did uh, bio T hormones. I, yeah. I would never have thought that. I thought, oh God, they're, you know, everyone gets a little bit brainwashed about hormones. That's beyond the scope of this, uh, this call for sure. But it, my, one of my mentors said, it's steady. They come in every three to four months and kind of like Botox. You don't make a million dollars on one hormone patient, but they, they come, they're reliable. Um, they don't, they want to keep coming. So I did that. And then I did, we bought a skin pen. I did a little bit of, um, like just Botox and dermal filler. We had a, we had sunscreen, you know, Elta sunscreen and like one retail product, one retail brand, just a few things. And I had my Cyton and I did halo, which is like an ablative laser and then the photo facials. So when did you end up in deciding to call yourself the Austin love doctor? So what I found, yes, yeah, so what I found is over the course of a couple of years, and so my, my business started out as Wrinkle Free MD. I came up with okay. the name, thought it was kind of cute. People remember it. And I've actually had people like, I sat next to somebody on the plane and they, they told me that they come to you and I live an hour away, but their skin looks so great. So it's, it's kind of cool to have a memorable name people can remember. Um, and so I started doing all this stuff and I had patients that were, I would felt like I was changing a lot of lives. And I really, really found the joy in my practice again. And the biggest joy that I found was treating men and women whose marriages and personal lives were suffering because of uh, bedroom issues. So erectile dysfunction or painful genital condition called lichen sclerosis or bleeding when they had intercourse. Uh, I mean, my record in my clinic is 18 years of a married couple that wasn't able to have sex, that was able to have sex again after wow. seeing me. And I mean, that, that doesn't make you just want to cry, right? Like happily married people. And it, it's very common. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. And yeah. I was very open to, I was just an open ear. I was very ready to talk about it. And I had, I just felt like I really helped patients a lot. And so I decided that I wanted to begin with my time sort of transitioning into specializing in that. It's a niche market. It's, I have so much passion for it. I do, there is a need. It's just people don't talk about it. Um, and it distinguishes me from other people in town because med spas are a dime a dozen. The laws in Texas are fairly lax, but there's, you know, gynecologists and urologists, sure but they're not doing what I'm doing. Nobody is, is treating men and women comprehensively. And yeah, they're sex therapists, but they're not able to do the medical treatments. So my thought was to really get the word out locally and then hopefully nationally that I can, we can do things to make people, men and women have sex again and have sex that they enjoy and bring passion back into their marriages. And so I just started, I came up with the name. I thought it was um, Austin's kind of funky. It's kind of fun. It's memorable. Um, the love doctor, because it's not just about sex. It's, it's about 
bringing people closer together. Um, and I actually trademarked that. So I own a federal uh, trademark for that name um, and started a podcast to kind of get the word out. And then just have slowly been building that brand. We're working on our social media. I'm, I'm, it's hard to advertise because uh, Facebook, Instagram, and like a lot of Google AdWords, they shut it down because right. uh, some of it involves platelet rich plasma, which is not, um, they're classifying it as, Anyway, they're just putting some bans yeah. on things right now unnecessarily, but it's hard. So it's definitely a, a word of mouth kind of uh, thing. The, there's a lifestyle community, which is what um, uh, swinger, the old term swingers, there's a big lifestyle community in Austin. And so they are people that value sex and talk about it. So I've gotten a lot of just client referrals that way, treat one, and then they tell other people Um and just slowly building the brand. And I've been very, very careful to not overextend myself and not, I learned my lesson. Don't keep buying equipment. Don't buy every machine. Slowly stick to what you've got and make, make the most of the equipment that you have and then buy something new when you're getting, there's enough demand for it. And so like I have this, this thing called the Zimmer Z wave. It, it puts out pulse waves. And we were using it for cool sculpting. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it sends out these, it's low intensity shockwave therapy. High intensity shockwave therapy is what they use to break apart kidney stones. And a patient came in who didn't want to get um, a needle in his penis, which is the, this other procedure that I do for erectile dysfunction. He didn't want to be able to use the pump. It's called the, the Priapus shot. And he was afraid because he didn't want his wife to know. So he asked me if I could do this sound wave procedure on him and I wasn't trained on it yet and he had seen on my website that hey you've got the machine you should be able to do it so I went and learned how to do that I do I do gains wave it's a brand of that uh basically a treatment protocol and I started doing that and what I slowly found is that I had way more demand for that than I had for cool sculpting because cool sculpting the market saturated and there was a lot more revenue in cool sculpt I mean in gains wave than there was in cool sculpting because the machine was already paid for and basically they were just paying for my time. Um, there was no consumable. There was no card that needed to get put in the machine. And man, were those guys happy. They're so happy. They love that treatment. And I love the treatment because I love to help people. And it just, it, the energy kind of fed off of itself. And I really enjoyed doing that. I love to treat couples. And so I started treating these men and the men then would have their wife come in because the wife needed hormones. And then the wife would come in and get Botox. And then she'd find out that I did testosterone while her husband's on testosterone shots. Well, maybe he sh I'll give him a bio tea book and then he'll come and get pellets with me. So really what I learned is that spending money on ads, which was a huge, huge waste of money. I think my first year I spent $60,000 on wow. advertising for cool sculpting, just for cool sculpting, huge waste of money. We got one person that specifically said they saw a cool sculpting ad who bought cool sculpting. But, but it took a while to build up my practice and build up my clientele to where I could take advantage of what they call internal marketing, where mm -hmm. you, you market to your own people and the friends that they know rather than putting it out to the public. And when I realized that you could put an ad in a paper for $25 off a haircut, right? Well, if a woman is going to move to a new town and she wants to get her hair done, most women are not going to just go because they saw an ad for $25 off a haircut. They're going to find somebody whose hair they like and ask them, who cuts your hair? Who does your hair? And the woman's going to say, it's Tina at Breeze. And they're going to say, okay. And they're going to call Breeze and ask for Tina. And if she's not available and they, for a month and they say, well, what about Sarah? Nope, I want Tina. People, if the clientele that I want are not, are going to be that choosy about who cuts their hair, which mm. will grow back. Those are the clients. That's the clientele that I want to pick me. And they're not going to pick me from an ad by and large. Most of my business is still word of mouth and right. internal marketing to my own existing clients. I, I love it. I love it. And I think that's where a lot of med spa owners or new med spa owners is failed to it is all they'll just put, well, I heard it, you know, just put more money into marketing and, and then they will come or we'll get a laser and then they're going to show up. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Nobody just shows up because you buy something. You do have to have a good website. You, you have to have a website that, that has some SEO optimization and you have to have a website that 
looks like a place people want to go. You don't have to have the fanciest place. I didn't spend a million dollars on my build out. You know, I didn't, I didn't put a hundred thousand dollar fish tank in the middle of it or get chandeliers or anything like that. I mean, that are crazy expensive, but it's clean. It's nice. It's modern. It's, it's, it's really that it's clean um, and yes. it's gender ambiguous. So mm -hmm. the colors I chose are teal and gray and orange and yellow. And it, so it's warm and it's, you know, kind of retro modern, but it's not like it's a place where it's all pink fluffy couches right, and it right. squirts, you know, lavender out of the vents because guys wouldn't want to come there. Right, there, right. there was one day, Mike, that I had um, a, a female patient walk in and she looks and I've got like, we were running a little bit behind. I had five guys sitting in my waiting room and she goes, do you treat women here? <laughs> and I thought, whoo, I have arrived. Right, <laughs> I've got right, a med right. spot full of men. Like I'm doing the right thing. But I'd like to grow Austin Love Doctor. My goal is to have it be its separate entity, have it be its own location, um, about maybe 20 minutes away from where I am. But all in good time, it, it needs to be able to support itself on it on its own. And as my as my time gets be to become you know, 75% of my clinic hours are doing the sexual wellness, then I will transition more to that. And I will hire somebody to come help me with my, my med spa part. And then I'll add some things like as probably a sex therapist and some educational workshops. And we're already working on online retailing of toys and things like that. I'm trying to get a little bit of mailbox money as well and have a little bit of online but you just, you, you can't just dump everything into something and just cross your fingers, sit on your couch and hope that it's going to work. I love it that, that you have when you're looking at your different procedures and your different treatments is, and, and we saw that in our clinic, it all kind of relates to one another. For example, we started off with weight loss and then really weight loss isn't a big money maker, but it brought in our hormone patients. And then from the hormone patients, they brought in their husbands. So then we're looking at different things, uh, you know, intimacy. Then they're coming in for, you know, my weight loss patients, when they were losing weight, they said, well, we need, we want to look better. So do you do Botox? And they were going to the place across town. Mm -hmm. We can bring that in. Exactly. So everything was just kind of related. And the more, it sounds like all the service you're doing, you're not just going out there and saying, hey, I'm just going to get a cold sculpting. You're going out there and saying, what else can I be doing to bring them in and spend money with me instead of going out to a competitor or, or someone else. Is that yeah. And taking a device and maximizing it. So yeah. that's in the way, for example, we do, we'd use it after cool sculpting. We can use it on plantar fasciitis to loosen up the feet. Like that's, that's $150 for 15 minutes of somebody's time just to, it feels great. <laughs> um, wow. You can use it for cellulite. So rather than buying, I don't like devices that are a one trick pony. Number right. one. The other thing is I don't like devices that have a consumable that every time you turn it on, you owe some company a hundred bucks or 200 bucks. Um, it, it's, that's really, really, really hard. But I, you know, my laser is phenomenal and I, it's the Bentley of lasers, but my warranty alone, it's expensive. I mean, my warranty alone is like $24,000 a year. So it's mm. two grand a month. So there's some overhead for sure. Um, but the other thing is, like I said, just, just, I don't sell anybody anything. So we are not, I hate to be sold as a woman. I don't want to go buy a car and have some guy pressure me and I've got to make a decision today. Everything we do is through education. And I would say probably 80% of our people that come in for aesthetics have never done anything more than maybe like a facial. They wear like a BB cream and they, you know, they wash their face if they're lucky, but they're all new to it. And so I don't want to sell somebody a $5,000 package, have them blow their entire year's savings and come in one time and then regret it and then never come back. I say, look, pick the one, you know, this is the thing that most bugs you start here. Let's start with a little Botox, get your hydrofacial, try one, you know, try a couple photo facials and see how that goes. And then you develop a relationship with them and you develop a trust with them. And then you want that person that's going to come in every one to three months and get something done buy a product and come in and get a procedure. And that long, that lasting business is much, much, much more successful than having somebody come and get a bunch of stuff once. And part of that is just building relationships with people. And I, I can't say that not that everybody would be successful at that because they might not. I, 
I know my clients' grandchildren's names. I know when their anniversary is. We send them a handwritten thank you card. I write birthday cards to everybody. Um, my top 10, my first year, my top uh, 10% last year get Christmas gifts that I hand deliver. I mean, I work at it. It's Nordstrom, right? It's, but those people, they're not going anywhere. And they're for all their friends because that you never know who that one client is going to be who maybe they only spend a thousand dollars with you, which is still a lot of money, but their best friend spends 10 and that's totally happened. And especially with the men, you just, they, you never know. Some guy will come in and he's, you find out he comes and asks you about a priapus shot and he's all dirty and you find out he owns a 600 acre ranch and he's a millionaire. He's got more money than what you're ever going to know. So just throw it all out there. Let people make their choices be there to answer questions, but never pressure anybody. It just doesn't work for us. I love it. I love it. And I know you've, you've got to go soon, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you said you knew all of your uh, great, uh, all the grandkids' names and your family's names. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't mention your sister, Katie Porter, who here in California and really out through the country now is a superstar um, in the in the political realm, what has she taught you, or what have you learned from your sister that that you're using in your in your own business? I think probably we learn most from our mom. Mm. Um, and my mom owned a quilting business. She was a she taught for a little bit, hated that, and then edited books for a while, and then started a quilting business. And really, just the way we were raised. My dad was a farmer, so he was an entrepreneur. But we were always told that my parents by my parents that they would be disappointed if we didn't try our hardest. And my sister won an election <laughs> that everyone told her couldn't be done. She did it with grassroots money, no PAC money in a district in Southern California that had been Republican since the sixties when it was built. And so it was 60 years, almost 60 years later. It's 50, pretty red. <laughs> totally. She won as a Democrat with, without taking corporate money. And it, she just, she just put the work in. She says, you know what? We just, we just went out there and we got people to vote and we got people excited. And so I would say, and then she, she went, once you have the opportunity, you have to make mom and dad proud. And mm. she has definitely not, she doesn't take her job lightly. She does everything she can uh, for people and she busts her ass. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people just in life don't do well because they're just lazy. And um, they don't listen to other people, you know, you don't, if I could have said, look, you don't know anything about business. I've got way more education than you do. I know what I'm doing and just done it. Instead, I said, oh, I've never done this before. What can you teach me? And I'm always learning. And she's always learning from her constituents. Like I'm here to serve you. What can I do? And I'm in a service job too, right? Like what, what right. can I do to make your experience better? What, what could we have done? What, what would you like to see here? And just really taking feedback, hearing people out, um, and just never stopping. Don't ever give up. Thank you for sharing it. Although I did watch a video from you and I did see you pull out a whiteboard or, or some type of, <laughs> I don't know if you do that for your own patients, but Hey, if it works in the family. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we've, we, we've got chalkboards and whiteboards and I teach I other physicians classes. I've got a whole webinar on how to help physicians escape the emergency room that I created. That's like a four part webinar. That's, um, uh, escape the er.com and it's uh -huh. not specifically for emergency physicians it's just using me as an example and aesthetics as an example for people to figure out kind of the mistakes i made and kind of how to read a business plan and do things but whiteboards and and people learn through you know through education don't ever quit learning um and i appreciate that i'm learning from you because i'm following you and i'm in all of the things you're doing and i'm like oh man but not in a jealous way like right it's it's community over competition it's saying okay well this isn't working don't keep cranking the same crank if it's not working find a new crank and listen to people who've paved the way and the trail ahead of you and take the things that they say with, you know, to a certain degree with the grain of salt. There's a couple of things that people have advised me that I said, I don't think that's ethical or I don't think that's legal or, you know, whatever. Check, definitely, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's, but um, be just, why would you throw away good advice and free advice? No. Right, right, right. We all know the, the adage about opinions, right? 
<laughs> and don't let and don't let pride get in your way. Right. I mean, right. And if you have knowledge to share with other people, share it. Oh share yeah, that, that's pretty big. That's been my mantra. So again, though, the website is escapetheer.com. Mm -hmm. Is that where they can go to if they want to contact you or reach out to you? They can, they can reach out through there. They can also reach me at austinlovedoctor.com. Um, and there's a way to contact us there. I teach, I teach physicians. I do dermal filler and Botox courses. I do platelet rich plasma courses. I teach sexual wellness courses. I can do marketing. I mean, I, I basically, I love to help. I, I enjoy teaching. I'm my sister with her whiteboard in Congress, but um, somebody taught me, right? So I'm always learning and I'm, I feel like I need to give that back. Um, so I'm willing to help anybody in any way that they can. It, it, it breaks up your day. It, it gives you something else to do and something to look forward to. I, I love, I love it. Um, so I'm going to, this has been amazing. I could talk to you for hours, but I know you got to go just what, what's some like last minute advice you want to give to the doctors out there. Maybe maybe someone who wants to start up an aesthetics practice or maybe someone who's been doing it for about a year or two and they're just not sure what, what, whether or not to continue. What advice would you give to them? You cannot be afraid to pull the trigger. You might fail. It's possible. It happens if you don't invest the time, more than the money, but the time and get good advice because there's a lot of, you know, uh, consultant companies out there that charge people a lot of money and it's all... BS, but you ha at some point you have to get your butt off the couch and take the leap because if you don't, you will never, you'll never do it. And then you'll spend all this time complaining and, and saying, well, how come I, I just got stuck in the ER and I'm, and, or I'm in the clinic or my life is miserable or what I'm going to do. You have to make the change. And, and, you know, I was fortunate in, that I was in my thirties and I thought, well, crap, this is really scary. I'm going to dump my savings into this and I could lose everything. But also at 30 something, I have another, hopefully, you know, 20 or 30 years to work, I could make it back. But if I just sat around and just, I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't know, I'm scared, you'll, it'll never happen for you. Right. And I learned that from my mom because my mom, when she was, had her quilting business and she was, she lectured. So she was a teacher, I guess. She lectured about how to do quilts. She wrote books. She had a television show and a magazine and it was her television show was oh. on public television. Have you ever seen that skit on SNL about sweaty balls? Yes. <laughs> that is based off of my mom's quilt show. It's like two women <laughs> wearing that and they kind of interrupt each other. Oh yeah. Yeah. That came out like Alex right Baldwin. Oh yeah. I watched Alex it like a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. And that, when they do that, that's based off of my mom's uh, public television quilt show. At least we never got, you know, truth. Of it. it totally was. <laughs> And so she had where her, her magazine publisher dropped their magazine and the magazine was what drove their business and fed their business. Cause people, they had circulation, people saw the magazine, then they bought these kits and then the TV show. So it was like, it was the bottom of kind of the pyramid. It was the, the everything that held everything together. And she was about to lose everything. And she took a leap and took a partner and she bought her magazine and got a publishing company and they started self publishing the magazine and she sold her company for tens of millions of dollars. Um, but it could have been zero and she, it right. was in the middle of a divorce and it, sh it could easily have been zero. And she said, but I, it, I have no choice. I have to do it. And so you have to sometimes just be a little bit afraid and just do it. Crush yeah. your fingers, take the leap. Take take the leap. I think the scariest thing is when I talk with doctors who I've either mentored or reached out to me and they're in the same position that they were a year ago, five years ago. They're still afraid. They're not willing to do it. They're not even, you know, creating a website is going to be some crazy thing that they've ever done before. I think the craziest thing is being in the same place, you know, being in the same place that you were. You're, still afraid. You're still afraid sometimes, right, Mike? Oh yes, all the time. I, I think owning a business, there's yeah. always some uncertainty. And I think even my husband, he doesn't, he doesn't quite get it because he's still in the ER mm -hmm. and he's like, well, why can't you just fire the person? And why can't you just like, it's not that easy, dude. Like, well, get a new laser tech, you know, get a, um, and there's always some uncertainty, um, you know, specifically if we want to there, you know, there's always a chance that something's going to blow up or that there's going to be a worldwide pandemic of some virus or there every day is a new challenge and there's always challenges with employees. And I think 
that was another hard thing is that if you're a hard worker, 99.9% .9 of people in the world are not, which is why you own the business and they don't own the business. Um, maybe, you know, maybe they never put the work in. And so, but there's always something and it, it, but it's scary, man. You could be going along just great. And then all of a sudden something happens. And so there's always going to be a little bit of fear, but it's manageable, but you have, you have to just plunge in or, or, or it'll never happen for you. I love it. I love it. And I think physicians are in a unique position because let's face it, we generally will have something to fall back on. If our, you know, we, if we've had to put a pause on things, we always can go back to the ER. We can always go back to the primary care. It may not be what we want, but unlike some others, we do our, we do have an advantage of some others. And what we need right now is more leaders, leaders like yourself, uh, leaders like your sister, people who are out there paving the way. And that's really what, what it's all about and seeing what you, know, you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to add on that, I would say you always need to be ethical. And course, I yeah. don't do anything that I'm not trained to do. And I stay in my lane. So I don't do surgery. I'm not a, I don't feel that even if I did a weekend course or a mm -hmm. one week course that I really am, would be good enough to do surgery and things like that. So I keep everything non-surgical because I still need to have my medical license to fall back on if there is some major issue where I'd have to close my business or temporarily or long term or my husband lost his job or got sick and we lost insurance and I had to go back to work. Um, so I, I make sure that I always protect my medical license at all costs. I don't do things that are unethical. I don't lie. I keep up my paperwork. I'm compliant with the you know medical board. And I make my staff be the same. And when I hire people, that is one of the things that I tell them. I tell them there's three things that you have to do at this job. The first thing is you protect my medical license at all costs, which means if I ever find out that you do anything unethical, that you see or treat a patient without me having seen and evaluated them, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you'll be terminated immediately with, with no pay. Um, the second thing is you need to market my business and love it enough that you talk about it when somebody asks you and you're out at a party and somebody goes, hey, tell me about cool sculpting. Hey, tell me about those, you know, vibrators you sell or whatever. You have to be passionate about it because if you're not passionate about it and advertising and, and just overcome with what you love, then it's going to come off to clients and, and that great grassroots marketing is huge. And the third thing is you actually have to do your job and do it well. So I tell everybody those, they have to do those three things. But at the end of the day, like you said, I've got my medical license to fall, fall back on. But when you start doing shady crap um, for, to make a buck, nope. Yeah, your gosh, this is so much good stuff. Just to add on to that, I actually have a relationship with the medical board. I've been a monitor. And I have a quote friend in the medical board of California, where if I think that things are going awry, I'm asking them, what's going on? What's, you know, what are they looking for next? So also you can even take that a step further at being uh, proactive. Uh, so you're not as always fearful. I know you got to go. This has been amazing. Uh, the website again is escapetheer.com. You can also find her at austinlovedoctor.com. Dr. Emily Porter, it has been a pleasure, and I know a lot of people get a lot out of this episode. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, and I hope we can do it again sometime. We'd love to have you again. And thanks, everybody. Follow her advice. Now is not the time to be complacent. Now is not the time to be scared. As always, guys, I always say every day, keep moving forward.